A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, this is what I commanded my people. Listen to my voice. Then I will be your God and you shall be my people. Walk in all the ways that I command you so that you may prosper. But they obeyed not, nor did they they pay heed. They walked in the hardness of their evil hearts and turn their backs, not their faces, to me. From the day that your fathers left the land of Egypt, even to this day, I have sent you untiringly to all my servants, the prophets. Yet they have not obeyed me, nor paid heed. They have stiffened their necks and done worse than their fathers. When you speak all these words to them, they will not listen to you either. When you call to them, they will not answer you. Say to them, this is the nation that does not listen to the voice of the Lord its God or take correction. Faithfulness has disappeared. The word itself is banished from their speech. Febum domini. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Come, let us sing joyfully to the Lord. Let us acclaim the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us joyfully sing psalms to him. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord who made us, for he is our God, and we are the people he shepherds, the flock he guides. Oh, that today you would hear his voice, harden not your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massa in the desert, where your fathers tempted me, they tested me, though they had seen my works. Dominus Vobiscum, and Lord Spirit, Lord Lectio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam, Gloria Divine. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute, and when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. Some of them said, by the power of Baal Zabul, the prince of demons, he drives out demons. Others, to test him, asked him for a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be laid waste, and house will fall against house. And if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that it is by Baal Zabul that I drive out demons. If I then drive out demons by Baal Zabul, by whom do your people drive out drive them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
When a strong man, fully armed, guards his palace, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger than he attacks and overcomes him, he takes away the armor on which he relied and distributes the spoils. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Verbum Domini. A part of Christ's ministry was the exorcism of demons. It's something that showed his power. Jesus rebuked demons and cast them out. And this caused division. Now, it's a remarkable thing because the crowds were amazed, but their amazement at this man being able to speak after being demon-possessed, their amazement at this does not necessarily lead to faith. It leads to two other kinds of questions. One part of the crowd says that he does this by the power of Baal Zabul. Baal Zabul means Prince Baal. Baal being the pagan god of the Canaanites, still worshipped even in the time of Christ, by the pagans to the north. But Jesus, one of the things that the Old Testament understood is that these various gods were either demons or nothingnesses. They would call them Elilim, nothingnesses, or sometimes, as in the book of Isaiah, they'd call them demons. So that when they ascribed real power to these deities. It was a demonic power. And they saw them as the demons that ruled these kingdoms. Something that is even behind Christ's temptation when Satan appears to Christ and says to him, I will give you all these kingdoms. Notice that Christ did not doubt that Satan had rule over them. He just would not bow down and worship Satan because you worship the Lord your God and him alone do you serve. So this sense of the demons having this reality was strong in the ancient world, especially the people of Israel. They would see them as demons. And when you read the stories of the gods, you see a demonic quality to them. They're usually working mischief. They're not beneficent by any means. Another part of the amazed crowd asks to, for a sign from heaven. Now, this is a great irony. What sign are they looking for? What is going to outdo the casting out of a demon? If there's any sign of heaven being powerful, is the casting out of a demon. Other signs could be ambiguous, like maybe changing stones into bread or something. If he did that, that could be ambiguous. They'd say, well, that's maybe some magician's power or something. But they should have been able to recognize that heaven was active here in casting out a demon. And it's this blindness, of the, the amazement and blindness that go together in the crowd. That's why we have this first reading from the prophet, prophet Jeremiah, chapter 7, that the, the Lord said, walk in the ways I command you that you may prosper, but they obeyed not, nor did they pay heed. They walked in the hardness of their own hearts, and they could not perceive the truth of what Jeremiah was saying. This is something that is a perennial problem, that people will see what God is trying to do, 
but because of their own hardness of heart. They don't allow it to sink in. And this is a problem that we want to confront in this Lenten season to make sure that we're not pointing fingers at the people of the time of Jeremiah or Christ, but rather we are examining our own consciences to see what are the signs of the presence of God that we see in our lives and how is my heart hardened to listen to words, the words of God? Am I able to listen to what the Lord has to say? Am I able to pay attention to the signs that God gives me? And I need to pay attention to the need to be open to conversion on new and deeper levels on a regular basis. This is the call of today's readings. Now Christ answers his critics. And he, first of all, starts off with a principle. Every kingdom divided against itself will be laid waste. And that's a decent principle. As a matter of fact, Abraham Lincoln quoted this when he said, a house divided against itself will fall. And Christ speaks about how house will fall against house, that not only kingdoms can have rebellions within them. But during those rebellions, one house falls against another, like we saw in our civil war, where sometimes brothers were fighting against brothers on different sides of the war. Houses can destroy each other in a civil war. Now, the question is this. Is Satan divided against himself? So that if I'm, if, you're, if I'm doing what you say, casting demons out by a demon, does that not mean that Satan is divided against himself and that there's a civil war among the demonic forces? Do you think Satan would tolerate that kind of civil disobedience within his kingdom? There's no way. And he is willing to use terrorizing in order to force people back into line. That is the way of the evil one. He will terrorize and make people absolutely frightened of him and terrified to do anything contrary to his orders. And we should remember that. That tactic is used by terrorists of this own time. And on, and on whose side are they? Whom are they imitating? God in his mercy or Satan in his terror? That's a very important question for us to pay attention to in this war because there's military and political warfare, etc. But there's also a spiritual warfare because so much of the terrorism is motivated by religious ideas. And that this is something that we need to pay close attention to. Then the answer, of course, that Jesus is saying is that, of course, Satan is not divided against himself. He wouldn't tolerate that. So how can I be casting demons out by Beelzebul? Secondly, you have your own exorcists. Your own exorcists cast the demons out. Do they do it by Beelzebul? Do you ask them that? And the answer, of course, is no. Jewish exorcists would never use Beelzebul to cast demons out. This would be against the very religion of Israel. But then he goes on to say, but if it is by the finger of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. This phrase, the finger of God, goes back to Exodus chapter 8, verse 19, when the magicians of Egypt are bested by Moses. 
No longer can they do the kinds of signs and wonders that Moses does. They imitate his signs in the first few signs of the plagues. But then the plagues overwhelm the magicians of Egypt and afflict them with boils. At which point they say, this is by the finger of God. So that Christ is saying that his ability to cast out demons is similar to the way God cast out the power of Egypt and its gods. As a matter of fact, one of the interesting things, each of the plagues, frogs and the water and so on, were all attacks on Egyptian deities. The Egyptians had a deity of the Nile, but God turned it into blood. They had a frog deity, a fly deity, and so on. And that by using these plagues to defeat Egypt, God was showing that these gods were not gods at all, that they were false powers, and that the Lord God is in charge of these forces of nature, and that he can use them to liberate his people from Egypt. So also Christ is using the power of God to liberate the people of Israel, his own people, from the power of the demonic. And in this way, he's showing that he is like a new Moses, bringing a new power. And he's done this in other ways, and he'll do it in more ways. For instance, multiplying the loaves and fish. Moses had called the Lord to bring down manna from heaven. Christ multiplies loaves and fish. These and other ways, he's the new Moses who's doing a greater liberation than freedom from Egypt by delivering us from Satan and sin. And so that's why he says, it's by the finger, if it is by the finger of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. You haven't just come into a new land, the promised land, but the kingdom of God has come upon you. And now we see that there's an invasion going on. Christ is leading an invasion of the forces of the kingdom of God over against the kingdom of evil. And it's not a civil war of demon versus demon, but it's an invasion of occupied territory by God, bringing the kingdom of God into the presence of this darkness that was the, at the time of Israel. Remember, the Romans were, had, were oppressing them, and they were subject to the Romans. And this is the bringing of the kingdom of God, not only to Israel, but to the whole world. And that that freedom from the demonic will be part of following Christ. Then he gives a short parable. When a strong man fully armed guards his palace, his possessions are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks and overcomes him, he takes away the armor and the spoils. The strong man who's armed is Satan and his devils. They're the ones who have taken over some people's lives and control their lives. And that this can go on in a variety of ways. It can go on in the case of full possession that debilitates and deforms human nature. That's one of the reasons that the evil one likes to possess human beings. Human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. When a demon possesses, he distorts that image and gets us to be disgusted with human beings and thereby with the image and likeness of God. That's his goal. But there are other ways in which the evil one can take over through violence, through any of the capital sins. There's a distortion when the lust industry distorts human love. Then there is a demonic distortion and there needs to be a rest restoration. Christ wants to conquer those forces of violence, oppression, 
lust, anger, and all the other capital sins. He wants to overcome those so that it's going to be in the overcoming of sin that the forces of evil are defeated. And Christ is that stronger king who is able to come and conquer the demonic forces. He can overwhelm them and despoil them, taking souls away from the clutches of evil. This is the power of Christ. And that's why he then sets a challenge to each of us. Whoever is not with me is against me. If you are not with Christ, you are against him and on the side of the evil one. And we see so many of these forces who are anti-Christ. They are not the anti-Christ of the end times, but they are anti-Christ. Remember, St. John in his first epistle warns us of many anti-Christs. And there are many of these anti-Christs in the world today who are doing all kinds of evil oppression, usually through violence and lust. Sex and violence are two of the main techniques that are rampant in today's world. But there are others as well. Avarice can be just as much a demonic device as lust and violence and anger. So there are all sorts of ways in which the evil one works. And if we are not for Christ, we are on the other side. And we must make that decision to always be for Christ and that we are not going to compromise with his enemies. We're not going to say, well, they have freedom of speech to use lust and anger and violence. They may have freedom of speech under civil law to do these crimes against human nature, but they do not have the right under God's law to do so, and we have no right to give support to it. If we are not with Christ, we are against him, and we must make those decisions to be with Christ and never against him. And he who does not gather with me scatters. This draws from the image of Ezekiel 34, with God as the good shepherd. Bad shepherds scatter the sheep because they frighten them. Good shepherds draw the sheep toward Christ. And we must be with Christ, drawing his people toward holiness, towards righteousness, towards goodness, towards Jesus and in that way help to win many more for the kingdom of God.